stimulus over and over and measured how long the babies kept looking at it. Over time, the babies grew bored with the same stimulus, so they looked at it less and less. Next, the key part. Babies were presented with one of two new stimuli, this time without any visual occlusion. One stimulus was an unbroken long rod that moved in the exact same way as the habituation phase. The other stimulus was two smaller rods that were unconnected but moved in synchrony. Any guesses which one surprised the babies the most? When the three-month-olds saw the unbroken rod, they barely took notice, as if they had been seeing it all along. But when they saw the two smaller rods moving in unison, they stared much longer, as if to say that they were quite surprised. This suggests that young babies perceive objects as connected holes. It's worth adding that this finding has been replicated with newborns, suggesting that it may be an, an innate constraint in how infants first see the world. So how does this connect up to word learning? Think back to the Gavagai example. This innate constraint on how we view objects suggests that when babies hear words, they may be more likely to think the word refers to a whole object, like the rabbit, rather than the parts of the object, like the ears or the tail. So what's the evidence for this hypothesis? Building on the work of Markman, George Hollick, now at Purdue, and his advisors from Temple University have provided an answer in a clever experiment. In their study, one-year-olds were presented a novel object that had two connecting parts. One part was plain looking, very boring, and the other part had a colorful pattern on it. After babies were presented with this two-part object, they were taught a novel label for it. The experimenter said, Look at the Modi. See the Modi? It's a Modi. The only thing the experimenter did while saying the word was to show the, uh, that the object could be broken into two parts and then put it back together. So the baby heard the, the word Modi both when the two parts were together and also when they were pulled apart. The question was, what did the babies think Modi meant? The whole object or one of the parts? To answer this, Hollick then presented the infant with two objects at the same time, the whole object with both parts and just the most interesting of the two parts. The babies were then asked, where is the Modi? Can you find the Modi? So where did they look? The one-year-olds looked at the whole object over 50% longer than they looked at just the most interesting part. Okay, well, you might say that the babies didn't really learn the words for the whole object. They just looked at it because it was more interesting. Well, to rule that out, Hollick did a follow-up study just showing the whole object and the interesting part without any labeling and then measuring how long the babies looked at each. When there was no label, the babies looked equally long at both objects. So it appears that hearing a novel label was the true cause of the whole object bias. You can see how such an early bias would constrain the problem of word learning to a large extent. If babies' first guesses about word meanings eliminate a whole range of possibilities, it would allow them to get an early foothold in, langu in language learning that may help them learn additional words faster. But as with any bias, this does have a downside. As adults, we know that not every word refers to whole objects. They sometimes refer to parts or the descriptions of parts. So this bias can actually cause children to make an occasional mistake. In one amusing example, the cognitive psychologist John McNamara describes a child who thought the word hot was the name for the kitchen stove. Still, even with the occasional error that comes with the whole object assumption, I hope it's clear how babies can greatly benefit from these early constraints on word learning. In addition to innate constraints, there are constraints that are acquired too. The act of learning words actually helps to rule out meanings of other words. For example, let me try something with you. If I were to show you two animals, like a dog and another animal that you've never seen, and I told you that one of these is called a kinkajou, which one do you think I'd be referring to? If you're like a typical three-year-old child, you'd pick the one you've never seen. This is Markman's mutual exclusivity bias. It may seem obvious to you that a novel name should go with a novel object, but how is a three-year-old supposed to know that? For all they know, kinkajou is just another word for dog, but that's not what they think. 
Connecting back to the Gavagai example, this heuristic would be useful for ruling out some potential meanings. Suppose that you had already learned a different Arunta word for rabbit. If you heard the Arunta speaker say Gavagai in the presence of a rabbit, you would likely assume that it refers to something other than the whole rabbit. Perhaps it refers to the movement of the rabbit or some part of the rabbit. In this way, the meaning of new words is constrained by knowing the meaning of other words. The mutual exclusivity bias is one of the most robust heuristics that children and adults use when understanding language. But there is much disagreement over what the mechanism is. On one hand, it could be a pretty simple cognitive rule that humans follow. The rule says that if you hear a new word, that word probably goes with something new rather than something old. Sure, we'd make mistakes with such a heuristic, but the, the gamble would pay off more often than not. On the other hand, the process could be more social in nature. It's not as if you used a simple cognitive rule to attach the meaning of kinkajou to the novel animal. After all, as adults, we're fully aware that even objects with established labels, like dog, can have many other names assigned to them as well. So you probably solved the problem differently. One way you could, could have done it is to consider pragmatic intent. You may have used shared knowledge that you and I both know what a dog is and what it's called, and you may have surmised that my intention in saying the new word, kinkajou, was to teach you something new. This mechanism is different from the simpler cognitive rule because it requires you to consider the intention of the speaker. Researchers have not yet determined which mechanism explains young children's early word learning, but it's possible that both are at play. Word learners may rely on a number of heuristics to break them into basic understanding of language. And as they get older, they may refine their strategies in a more focused and sophisticated way. Please keep this in mind over the next few lectures when we talk about other factors in language learning. More often than not, language learners rely on multiple mechanisms on multiple levels of analysis. Markman's third constraint is the taxonomic assumption. Once children move past mutual exclusivity and have accepted that objects often have multiple labels, they start to really appreciate that words often refer to categories of things. For example, if you were to point to a dog, you could label it as a dog, or you could describe it more generally as a pet or an animal. In one of the first studies to explore how children use language to understand categories, Markman and Jean Hutchinson had a puppet introduce preschool children to a picture of a well-known object, like a dog. By the way, puppets are often used in word learning studies to keep things interesting for children, and actually, I think for the experimenters, too. After showing the picture, the puppet said, can you find another one? While showing the children two new objects that had different relationships to the dog. One object was a cat and the other was a bone. Children selected the cat only 25% of the time, which suggests that they may prefer to make thematic associations, dogs like bones, more than taxonomic ones. Dogs and cats are both animals. However, things changed when the puppet labeled the first object. In a separate group of children, the puppet presented the picture of the dog, but this time said, see the Dax? Can you find another Dax? In this condition, when asked to pick, pick an object, children lost their preference for the bone and now chose the cat 65% of the time. This suggests that when a novel label is introduced, children treat things quite differently. With a label, they now see the word Dax as referring to a category or type of things, a uh, type of thing like dogs and cats or animals, and not a th as a thematic relationship between things. In this way, it appears that when language is present, children are biased to think about taxonomic categories. Let's apply this to Quine's problem. Suppose that prior to the rabbit, you had both seen a zebra, a snake, and a bird. And for each one, the Arunta speaker had said, Gavagai. By the time you got to the rabbit, you may use your taxonomic assumption to guess that the word refers to the larger category of animal rather than some thematic relationship between the rabbit and some other thing. In the years since Markman's classic study, researchers have explored just how early babies treat new words as category labels. As with other abilities, we've learned that babies are surprisingly savvy at very young ages. In one remarkable study, 
Alyssa Ferry, Susan Hespos, and Sandra Waxman of Northwestern University tested categorization at the raw age of three months old. They presented these infants with pictures of different species of fish. With each picture, they also played an audio track that said, look at the Toma. Do you see the Toma? They did this eight times with eight different pictures of fish, but the same audio track for each one. Next was the test phase. The babies were then shown two pictures. One was a new exemplar of the fish category, and one was a picture of a totally new category, a dinosaur. The key measurement was to record which objects the babies looked at more. Remarkably, these preverbal infants differentiated the two pictures, looking longer at the image within the same category, the fish, than the one in the new category, the dinosaur. Now, you might be asking yourself a good question. Does this really have to do with babies using speech to form categories? Or is, or is it just that babies had gotten used to uh, looking at fish, not dinosaurs? The researchers addressed this valid question by repeating the exact same study with a different set of three-month-olds. But there was one change. They replaced the auditory naming of the objects with an auditory tone during the exposure phase. So there was a sound that accompanied each picture, but no speech. After eight exposures of fish plus tones, the babies were shown the two objects, a new fish and a dinosaur. 